Rainbow Rare Earth is a rare earth company that's developing a couple of uh, rare earth projects uh, around the world at the moment. We have the flagship project being Pelabor in South Africa, where we're looking to extract um, rare earth out of phosphor gypsum stacks there. And then last year we signed a deal with Mosaic in Brazil to do a similar thing to extract rare earth uh, from the phosphor gypsum that has been produced uh, by Uberaba, the plant in Uberaba in Brazil. So very, two very exciting projects and things are moving along very, very nicely. So it's been a very, very good year for Rainbow. We, um, last year we attracted a $50 million commitment from the US government via the DFC into the project at Palaboa for uh, as, as development equity. And that shows very, a lot of confidence by the US government in Rainbow as they've done their own DD on us and on our process. We've also announced that we've uh, started our two pilot plants, the front end at Mintec in South Africa, where we're producing a serum depleted mixture with carbonate. This mixture with carbonate um, has been derived from phosphogypsum at Palaboa, which is the rare set in the phosphogypsum, and we are extracting the rare out of this phosphogypsum and producing a mixture with carbonate, as I mentioned. We're then shipping that carbonate to a facility in Florida, in Lakeland, where they're doing the final downstream separation, which is to produce separated rare earth oxides. And we've got the four key uh, permanent magnet rare earths, known as neodymium, presidinium, terbium, and dysprosium. Our initial separation has been very, very positive using the KTEC technology, which is an RP developed uh, by the American company called KTEC. And as I've mentioned, our first uh, separation results have been very positive, and we'll end up doing three stages of separation to get to our final purity level which is 99.5% purity of separated oxides which then feeds uh, a, a metal uh, business uh, a metal and, and business that turns into alloy and that alloy then gets fed to the permanent magnet manufacturers there's, there's still a couple of uh, chains in the strategic supply chain for rare earths that have to take place after we produce separated rare earth oxides are 17 elements all found together um, on the periodic table and um, all these 17 elements are, are say grouped together and when you mine them you mine them as a concentrate but like all concentrates there's different components of each rare earth within that concentrate so the four key rare earths that everyone's looking for at the moment or it's known as a permanent magnet rare earths being neodymium, presidinium, dysprosium and terbium now these things end up in permanent magnets now permanent magnets are critical to the green energy transition because they're going to electric cars, wind turbines, drones, any handheld consumer device, your cell phone vibrates through a permanent magnet, your AirPods have permanent magnets in them. And as I said, they're critical for if we want to achieve net zero in terms of the rollout of electric vehicles globally, as well as wind turbine power. Very, very important. As I mentioned, these rare earth permanent magnets are also going to things like air conditioners. Uh, three years ago, China made a, uh, issued a decree that all air conditioners in China have to have a permanent uh, motor using rare earth magnets. Wind turbines have two tons per turbine of permanent magnets. Of those two tons, about 700 kilograms are rare earths. So each wind turbine takes a huge amount of rare earth. And also, very important in defense. So an F-35 fighter jet, one jet, has 420 kilograms of rare earth elements per jet. They're going to night vision goggles, they're going to heat seeking missiles, they're going to missile guidance systems. So very important for defense. At the moment, globally, the geopolitics are the worst we've seen, I think, in 30 odd years. And so this is making it even more strategic for independent sources of rares to be found outside of China, because China controls 80% of primary production through 60% in-country and 20% in Myanmar, but they control 95% of the downstream processing. And like any business, if you have one supplier, it's not good for business. So for the whole world to have one supplier of these key permanent magnets, effectively China is not good business sense and so 
we see the West now focusing on trying to develop independent supply chain outside of China, especially America, the EU, the UK. Very, very focused on this. Japan already has done this by financing a business called Linus in Australia. Linus are one of the biggest rare earth mines in production outside of China, and they go all the way down stream to separating rare earth uh, into rare earth oxides, and which then feed Japanese permanent magnet manufacturers. We have a bigger uh, business in, uh, in America called MP Materials, but they only produce a rare earth concentrate, which is your first stage of your mine production. This has to go for further downstream processing. Right now, they send it to China, but they're all onshoring this, uh, this separation and beneficiation on US soil, but they're not there yet. It'll take time for them to get there. And as I said, this is critical to build this independent supply chain outside of China uh, and to create this, this environment where we can try and achieve the, the targets of COP28, which is net zero by 2050. Rainbow Rare Earths is a very good, uh, strong investment case from the economics point of view because we're extracting the rare earths out of phosphogypsum stacks, which is already mined. And that means we have far fewer processes. And that shows in our PEA that we published in 2022, where we've got an EBITDA margin of over 75%. We've got an RR of over 44%. And we will generate $190 million of EBITDA on a $300 million capex spend. So very, very good numbers for any rare earth project in the world right now. And that forecast rare earth price when we're coming into production, we're looking to be in production in 2026. Uh, that EBITDA per annum is looking to be around about $300 million um, of, of EBITDA per annum. Still roughly $300 million capex spend and our EBITDA margin is looking to be above 80%. So very, very strong case. We can withstand uh, um, a low pricing environment and we'll still make money with those margins.